Welcome to The Debate. Today we're diving into, well, a fascinating cosmic puzzle. It involves the recently discovered Comet Swan 25b and its really perplexing connection, at least in the public mind, with the mythical planet Nibiru. Now, astronomers, they have a very clear distinction between the two, but this uh, widespread confusion offers a unique lens, I think, to understand how astronomical information actually gets processed in our modern world. So our central question today is this. Why, despite really unequivocal scientific evidence separating comet Swan 25b from the mythical Nibiru, why does the public's confusion and this conflation of these two distinct celestial phenomena persist? Now, my perspective is that the robust scientific methods and the readily available data offer such clear distinctions that um, any continued conflation primarily stems from just overlooking verifiable facts. And I'll be arguing that even with all that clear scientific evidence, which I absolutely agree is clear, deeper psychological tendencies and the specific dynamics of how information spreads today, especially online, play a much more significant role in this persistent confusion. It's, it's really a complex interplay, you know, not just a simple matter of ignoring facts. Okay, well, let's start with the facts then about Comet SW25b. Officially, it's designated C2025R2 Swan. Its existence is grounded in direct, verifiable, scientific observation and data. This makes its distinction from the fictional Nibiru uh, unambiguously clear. This isn't some hidden object. It was first spotted September 11, 2025 by an amateur astronomer, Vladimir Bazugli. He was using data from the SWAN instrument, which the Solar Wind Anisotropies instrument on NASA's SOHO spacecraft, that's the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, which, you know, has been studying the sun for years. And its discovery was confirmed pretty quickly by multiple observers. Michael Mattiazzo in Australia was one, and we have images widely available from networks like Space Flux. So this is a real comet with observable characteristics. It's got a magnitude between plus 6 and plus 7.4, which means it's bright enough to be seen with small telescopes, maybe even good binoculars, especially if you're in the southern hemisphere looking near Spica in Virgo. It's even showing a significant visible ion tail about 2 degrees long. That's a clear sign of active outgassing, which is expected as it just passed its perihelion, its closest point to the sun, on September 12th at a distance of about half an AU. Half the Earth's sun distance, right? Exactly. Half an astronomical unit. And its closest approach to Earth is projected for October 19th, 2025 at around 0.26 AU. And look, its orbital data is continuously refined by organizations like the Minor Planet Center, the MPC. They track all these small solar system bodies. Comets, you know, they're ancient remnants of our solar system. They behave exactly like SWAN 25b does. They become active, they become visible as they approach the sun. And there's even a possibility of a minor meteor shower around October 5th if its orbit happens to intersect Earth's path. That's a totally natural, predictable astronomical event, not some, you know, mysterious anomaly. Now contrast that with Nibiru. Where does that come from? Solely from pseudoscientific speculation. Zachariah Sitchin originally, and later picked up by conspiracy theorists from figures like Nancy Leder and David Mead. These claims have been thoroughly and repeatedly debunked by the scientific community. A planet of Nibiru's supposed size. They claim it's Jupiter-like and its proposed orbit. It would have been detected years ago by our wide field survey telescopes, things like PanStars or NEOWISE. And maybe more importantly, such a massive object would gravitationally disrupt the orbits of the known planets in our solar system. We just don't see that. There's a complete absence of any empirical evidence for Nibiru versus this wealth of detailed observational data for SWAN 25b. It tells us one is undeniable fact and the other is, well, pure fiction. Okay, I absolutely see why you emphasize the undeniable scientific facts. And again, I'm not disputing the existence of Swan 25b or the mythical nature of Nibiru at all. But I come at this from a slightly different angle. I think the enduring public confusion isn't just about a failure to check the scientific data. It feels like a far more complex phenomenon, one that's deeply rooted in human psychology, certain historical patterns, and frankly, the contemporary digital media landscape. Humans, 
well, we seem to have this inherent psychological tendency to seek patterns and meaning in celestial events. We've always done it, right? Linking them to significant earthly occurrences. You mentioned Halley's Comet in 1066, seen as a portent for the Norman invasion. Right. So this pre-existing cognitive framework makes it incredibly easy for a newly announced celestial object, especially one that gets described, even scientifically sometimes, as appearing suddenly after being hidden by the sun, you know, after solar conjunction, to get absorbed into existing doomsday narratives. And social media platforms, particularly X, they play this kind of dual, often contradictory role here. Sure, they can disseminate scientific facts encourage observation, which is great, but they also supercharge the spread of misinformation. When you see terms like rogue comet or harbinger of doom trending around the hashtag Swan25B hashtag, even if that wasn't the intention of the astronomer's posting, it can inadvertently trigger those deep-seated associations with Nibiru's catastrophic claims. And what's really fascinating to me is that the public's experience with previous failed Nibiru predictions, remember 2003, 2012, 2017, it doesn't necessarily breed skepticism in everyone. For some, it seems to foster a belief in a kind of hidden truth where a new, maybe unforeseen object like Swan 25b gets reinterpreted as the real Nibiru, finally revealed. And here's the kicker. Even perfectly valid scientific explanations, like the Holacek effect, which explains why comets near the sun are hard to spot until after they pass it, well, that can get twisted. To a public already primed for conspiracy, this perfectly normal observational effect can be misinterpreted as evidence of a cover-up or some miraculous sudden arrival. And that just fuels the Nibiru myth instead of debunking it it becomes this powerful feedback loop. That's a compelling point about those psychological tendencies. And mentioning the Holoshek effect is interesting, but I'm still not entirely convinced that the scientific explanation is necessarily misinterpreted as much as it might be simply overlooked or ignored. The detailed, peer-reviewed, continuously updated scientific data for SWAN 25b, I mean, the discovery process via SOHO SWAN, its current brightness, the projected orbit, that two-degree ion tail, we talked about it, it provides an absolutely irrefutable framework of facts. Organizations like the Minor Planet Center, they actively collect and refine this astrometric data. The process is completely transparent, it's verifiable by anyone who cares to look, and the contrast with Nibiru's origin, these speculative interpretations of ancient texts, these debunked conspiracy theories, it's just so stark. So, I still tend to argue the core issue isn't necessarily the difficulty in processing nuanced scientific explanations, but maybe a fundamental lack of willingness by some people to actively engage with and understand these verifiable facts. Or perhaps just not making the effort to seek out credible sources over, you know, sensational ones. If you look for the real information, it's there. It's laid out clearly. Well, I agree the scientific evidence for SWAN 25B is robust, and yes, it's accessible. But the public's engagement with it, as you sort of hinted, it is filtered through various lenses. The sheer speed and volume of information, especially on platforms like X, it means that nuanced scientific explanations, which often need specific terminology to be precise, right? Whether you're talking about Lyman alpha imaging from SOHO or astrometric uncertainty in orbital calculations, they can be genuinely difficult to fully grasp for a lot of people. They're constantly competing with this flood of sensationalized headlines and much simpler emotionally charged narratives. So I don't think it's necessarily a flat refusal to engage, but maybe a significant hurdle in just processing complex detailed information when it's always up against these simpler, often frankly more exciting stories. And even a perfectly valid scientific point, like a comet appearing suddenly after solar conjunction, as we discussed, it can just so easily be twisted into a narrative of secrecy or some mysterious event. This isn't necessarily about people being unwilling to seek out facts. It's more about the inherent difficulty for, say, an average person scrolling through a feed to prioritize and understand that kind of detailed astronomical information when it's presented right alongside something that fits a pre-existing, 
really captivating, maybe even scary narrative. And that, in my view, creates this fertile ground where existing conspiracy theories about hidden planets like Nibiru can just keep taking root. Okay, I understand the challenge of information overload and how those narratives can be, well, sticky. But I still think social media platforms are also powerful tools for good here. They do disseminate real-time astronomical updates, they provide observation tips, they can foster genuine scientific curiosity. We've seen this with the active discussion and the data sharing around SWAN 25B among both amateur and professional astronomers. When they're used responsibly, these platforms let the global astronomy community share verifiable data and celebrate new discoveries in a way that just wasn't possible before. You even see, you know, lighthearted posts and jokes comparing Swan 25B to other comets. There was one from at XPTLC I saw, suggesting a healthy scientific engagement is definitely possible. That seems like a stark contrast to the fear-mongering usually associated with Nibiru. So, to me, the problem maybe isn't the platforms themselves fundamentally, but perhaps more about specific users who actively seek out and promote the sensationalist stuff over the credible sources. That's a fair point about the potential of social media. And you're absolutely right. It does facilitate some incredible scientific sharing. But have you maybe considered its inherent structural limitations, the things that often seem to override its potential for good? Despite that capacity for scientific dissemination, social media's basic architecture you know, driven by algorithms that are designed to prioritize engagement and virality, well, that inadvertently gives disproportionate reach to precisely the sensational or emotionally charged content. Trends in hashtags like hashtag Swan25B, even if they start out purely for scientific discussion, they can be so easily co-opted or misinterpreted. It doesn't take long before you see them getting linked to those harbinger of doom narratives. The sheer volume of information just makes it incredibly difficult for individuals to consistently tell the difference between credible scientific reports and speculative or conspiratorial claims, especially when, visually, they're presented with pretty similar weight and urgency on a platform like X. You know, an account like, say, at Epsilon Indic might innocently post about Swan 25B dazzling sky watchers, which sounds positive. But in a fast moving feed, that description could easily be recontextualized within a doomsday narrative without a second thought. This just creates an environment where conflating real objects with mythical ones isn't just possible. It's often maybe algorithmically probable. Hmm. I'm still not quite convinced that the platform structure is the primary driver or that it somehow absolves individuals of the responsibility to evaluate sources. For me, the core issue still feels like a fundamental gap in scientific literacy for some segments of the public, particularly in areas like, you know, basic orbital mechanics or just the characteristics of different kinds of celestial bodies. Think about it. Understanding that Chuan 25b is a relatively small nucleus, basically ice and dust, emitting an ion tail, versus Nibiru's claims of being a Jupiter-sized planet, the physical discrepancies are just enormous. One is an observable, relatively small, icy body. The other is this fictional gas giant that would literally wreak havoc on the solar system. And furthermore, the repeated failures of all those Nibiru predictions, 2003, 2012, 2017, logically, that should lead to a complete rejection of the myth, shouldn't it? It really emphasizes that evidence and reasoned analysis, not unfounded speculation, should guide how we form our beliefs. If one genuinely engages with the established scientific facts, the distinctions between S1, 25B, and Nibiru are simply undeniable. It almost feels like a choice sometimes to not look at the facts. I hear you, but I just don't quite buy that it's simply a deficit of knowledge or only a conscious choice to ignore facts. Let me try to explain why I think it's more complicated. It's about how that knowledge, or maybe the lack of it, interacts with these really deeply ingrained psychological tendencies and historical precedents we've touched on. The human mind is incredibly prone to things like confirmation bias, right? We tend to interpret new information in a way that confirms what we already believe. We're also hardwired for pattern recognition and for narrative construction. We want stories. We look for them. 
and comets throughout history have often been associated with significant, sometimes ominous events. You mentioned Halley's Comet in 1066 earlier. So when a new object like Swan 25b appears, these cognitive biases can lead people to instinctively try and fit it into pre-existing frameworks, even frameworks based entirely on myth. This seems especially true for those who might still harbor a kind of what-if feeling after those previous Nibiru predictions didn't pan out. They might view Swan 25b not as a completely new, unrelated object, but almost as a delayed fulfillment, or maybe a new manifestation of that hidden planet idea, despite all the scientific disclaimers. So it's not necessarily a complete lack of facts they're dealing with. It's more like an alternative, maybe often more emotionally satisfying framework for interpreting those facts or perceived facts. And that is the real challenge, I think, that science communication faces here. Okay, well, this discussion really underscores that while the sociological and psychological factors influencing public perception are uh, undeniably intriguing and certainly important to understand, the fundamental distinction between Swan 25b and Nibiru remains squarely rooted in verifiable scientific evidence. Swan 25b offers this exciting, tangible opportunity for genuine scientific observation, for understanding our solar system better. It's an endeavor that stands in really stark contrast to unsubstantiated myth. Ultimately, the clarity of the scientific data, when it's truly engaged with, should guide our understanding of the cosmos. I agree completely. The scientific distinction itself is crystal clear. But the case of SWN 25b and Nibiru serves as such a compelling, almost real-time illustration of the ongoing challenges in public science education, and maybe even more critically, the absolute need for robust media literacy in our digital age. It just demonstrates that facts, no matter how clear or accessible they might be, have to constantly contend with these powerful psychological predispositions and the complex, often pretty chaotic dynamics of information dissemination today. Understanding why these confusions persist is in many ways just as vital as presenting the facts themselves, because only then can we maybe pave the way for more effective, more resonant scientific communication in the future. Well said. Ultimately, I think this exchange highlights humanity's enduring fascination with the cosmos. It's a curiosity that drives both, you know, rigorous scientific inquiry and the persistence of myth. It's a reminder that our gaze remains fixed on the skies, always seeking meaning one way or another. Exactly. And it also reminds us that the journey from a scientific discovery to widespread public understanding is rarely, if ever, a straight line. This conversation, hopefully, encourages everyone listening to delve deeper into the rich material available out there, fostering a greater appreciation for both the genuine wonders of space and, perhaps, the intricate ways we as humans perceive and interpret them.